Hey guys, welcome to the video, welcome to my garage. It's been two weeks now since I put out the video where I found out that Ratchet isn't gonna fit on the trailer without some more extensive modifications, which brought me to the realization that I had probably missed the window over the winter to get Ratchet out to the off-road park. So after realizing that, I decided I needed to just hunker down and get some work done in the shop here. So what I was gonna do, what I'm going to do, is start working on the fiberglass one piece front end for Ratchet, but in order to do that, I decided I finally needed to tackle the project of me not really having substantial heat out here in the garage. So I spent the last two weeks purchasing a furnace and installing it. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I hooked it up and I'm gonna show you how it works. First of all, let me put a disclaimer out there. With this video, I'm gonna show you how I installed this furnace and I'm kind of going to show you how a high efficiency furnace works. I'm not recommending that you install your own furnace if you don't know exactly what you're doing. Professionally, I am in the HVAC industry. I've installed many furnaces in my lifetime. I'm currently still in the HVAC industry. I used to be a service technician, I'm not anymore, but I'm still in the industry. So keep that in mind. When I'm showing you all of this stuff, this is what I do on a professional level. If you install a furnace and you don't know what you're doing, it could be deadly because you're dealing with combustion gases that can suffocate you. So it's right now a Saturday morning. It's about 8.30 in the morning out here in Colorado and it is an absolutely beautiful day. The sun is shining. It's supposed to be about, I think the high is supposed to be about 44 degrees today. In the sun right now where I'm standing here, it's absolutely beautiful, very comfortable, nice and warm. The issue becomes my garage, you can, you can see from the shadow right now, my garage faces the other way of the sun, and although some of it gets hit by the sun, the inside of my garage here stays very cold, very cold, and although it's not necessarily insulated, it is completely drywalled. So it takes the garage essentially all day to catch up to the outside, and it'll never really catch up to it, but by the end of the day, the garage will be a little bit more comfortable. Right now, if you guys can see that, this is the thermostat I installed. Right now it's 36 degrees in here. This thermostat will rise very slowly as the day goes on. So the situation I always found myself in is it would be a beautiful day out in the backyard. The garage would stay very, very cold all morning and well into the afternoon. Now with my furnace, I don't really plan to run it all day every day because I think because it's not insulated, I, I would be wasting a lot of energy. But on a morning like this, I'm gonna go turn it on and I think it will raise the temperature of the, the garage probably 15 degrees pretty quickly. And then uh, I'm thinking that once it warms it up, it'll probably stay comfortable. If it's, if it's 50 to 55 degrees, maybe 55, that's pretty comfortable. I can work out here in a just a light sweatshirt all day if it's 55, that's no problem. Right now it's 36. I can almost see my breath. My hands are cold. I keep doing stuff like this where I'm tucking my hands in here and any any tools that you pick up are just really, really cold and over time it gets really uncomfortable. So if this furnace can bring the garage up to 55, for me that's totally doable. I can work in that all day long. And maybe, maybe even warmer, maybe I'll get it up to 60. I don't know, if I'm doing the fiberglass work, I'll probably try to keep the garage at 60 degrees just for the curing of the fiberglass. I think with this furnace, it'll be able to do that. So here's what I got. It's a Goodman 80,000 BTU high efficiency furnace. It is 92% efficient, which is high, uh, that's medium efficiency. They go up to 96. I think a couple of them get a little bit higher than 96 at this point. But this furnace is used, I got it off Craigslist for $200. It's only two years old. So I got a smoking deal. I think this is just a great deal on this furnace. Furnaces are like furniture where they're kind of expensive. A furnace like this, I think would probably cost me around 1500 bucks, brand new, give or take a little bit. Finding one for 200 bucks that was only two years old was a great deal. Um, but you know, furnaces are the kind of thing where once you buy them and install them, 
once you remove them, their value just goes down to almost nothing. So I wasn't, you know, you can go on Craigslist and for one to $300, there's furnaces on there all day. They're all different ages, all different conditions. The, the trick is you have to look for one that you know that you can work with and really only buy one where the seller has good pictures so that you can see what kind of condition it's in. This one is a little bit beat up, but for the most part, it's, it's actually in really good shape. That's funny, as I'm making this video, I'm freezing, but I don't want to turn the furnace on yet. I want to show you guys a couple things on it before I turn it on. So let me get through this, show you a couple things so I can actually turn it on. I don't want to film it while it's running because it's pretty loud and I know that this camera will pick up all that background noise and you won't really be able to hear me. So what I did here is this is an upflow furnace. I made a little stand here and the bottom is cut open so it pulls the air in from the bottom. I don't have a filter down here. I'm not sure I'm going to put a filter on there. I haven't decided yet. If I do want to put a filter on there, I can just put a filter up there and put little clips that hold it in place. But I'm afraid if I do put a filter down there, it will get dirty so quick that I will just constantly be replacing the filters. The downside is if I don't put a filter on there, then little dirt and dust particles will get caught on the fan blade as a spinning round and over time that can unbalance it but what what i've done on my furnaces before because i'm a little bit of a psychopath is once a year or maybe every other year i would actually pull the the blower out and i would clean the motor and the fan blade just for i don't even know why like i said because i'm a, a little bit of a psychopath and if i do the same thing with this furnace then I know that I'll be able to keep the blade clean. So I don't know, I haven't, I haven't decided on that yet. For right now, there is no, there's no filter down there. Anyways, the fan pulls the air in, blows it up through the heat exchanger, which is right around here. And then it comes out and I just built a real small plenum to go on top. And then there's only four five inch outlets that come out of here. These two go directly through the floor and they just dump under the loft because the area that I want to clean or heat up the most is under the loft. That's where I do most of my work. So those two just blow down there and, and throw some heat down there. And then on this side, this one just blows wildly out here just to, to warm some of this. And then this one runs across there, down, and then I've got an elbow on there. And the reason for that is that elbow, you can actually turn it and rotate it. So that one, I can actually adjust it a little bit. If I'm maybe working on something out there, I can turn that elbow over there to heat that area up. If I'm working primarily under here, I can turn it this way and shoot some of it over here. It just, having that over there gives me a little bit of options as to where I can shoot that. This is an 80,000 BTU furnace, so it's probably pushing out 1,600 CFM, roughly. I've got four takeoffs, which means theoretically each one's moving 400 CFM. 400 CFM out of a five inch round pipe is a lot which means that these have a lot of velocity going through there, so the air is blowing out of them real fast. I'll show you down below just how fast it's blowing out when we have this running, but I did that on purpose because I don't want air just kind of farting out of there. I want it flying out of there so that I can point it and direct it. You wouldn't want to do that on a residential setup. You lose a little bit of efficiency that way, but for this application, this will work out pretty well. I also have quite a bit of leakage up here. You can see I didn't seal any of this, so I do get some air leakage here, and that's why I don't have anything directly pointing up towards the loft up here. I'm just assuming that with my leakage and once it's running, all of this pipe gets nice and toasty, and so just the furnace itself radiates a lot of heat that so far um, seems to make a difference on the loft up here. If I need to, I can always cut something up here and shoot something this way if I want to, but for now, I'm rolling with it how I have it. All right, now we're looking inside the furnace here, and let me go over real quick what's gonna happen when I go downstairs and tell the thermostat to run the heat. This is what they call the inducer motor, and this is pulling combustion gases from the heat exchanger and blowing them up my flue pipe, which goes out the side of the garage. What's gonna happen is, first thing is, the furnace will tell this to run, so this will start running, this is going to make these two air proving switches. The air proving switches will tell the computer that number one, the inducer motor is in fact running, and number two, that my traps for the 
condensing water have water in them. If they don't have water in them, then air can pull right through them. And if air pulls through them, these air pressure switches wouldn't make. So that's how the computer knows that the, indu the inducer motor is running and that the traps have water in them. This furnace, pretty much any furnace over 80% efficiency, the combustion gas is going to get so cool that it's going to condense water and the heat exchanger and the inducer motor is going to collect that water. It's going to drain out here. There's a little trap right on the other side of this door and then it's going to drain out of here. Typically in your house, this drain would then go to an actual drain. Up here, I just have it feeding into a bucket. I say for now, but I, it's, I'm probably always going to use this bucket because I think it would take me weeks to actually fill that bucket up. So I'll, I'll see how that goes, but I'll probably just have a bucket there. Anyways, once the motor's running and the switches are made, then the furnace is going to send power to this device, which is the hot surface igniter, and that's going to glow red hot. I think it's going to do that for 15, 20, 25 seconds, whatever. Once that timer expires, then it's going to energize the gas valve. This is my gas line coming up here. It comes in here into the gas valve. It'll energize the gas valve. It's going to put gas into the rail here. And then all four of these are my burners. When the gas th goes through there, it's going to hit the hot surface igniter and it's going to light. And then the flame will go across and all four of these will light. And then at that point, the furnace will be looking at this, which they call the flame sense rod. That rod is going up through the flame of this burner. And the computer then will sense that the flame is there and then it'll know that the flame has lit. So it will continue running. Those are part of the safeties. If it ever sees that the flame is gone, then it shuts down the furnace. So on a high level, that's how these high efficiency furnaces work. Once it fires everything up, it'll continue running for I think around 30 seconds, just allowing the heat exchanger and the furnace itself to heat up. After about 30 seconds, then it'll tell the fan to run and then the fan will start pushing air through and that's when I'll be actually pumping heat into the space. So I'm gonna set the camera up on the tripod and then I'm gonna go tell the thermostat to run the heat. All right, I, I hope that's close enough that you'll be able to see the hot surface igniter and the inducer, but. Either way, I'm going to go down and tell the thermostat to run heat. All right, you can see now the inducer motor is running. Now the air pressure switches should be telling the printed circuit board or the computer that everything is good. And now shortly here, yeah, now the hot surface igniter. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but it's it's heating up. It's starting to glow red hot. All right, now if you heard that click, after a timer expired, the gas valve opened, put gas through there, the gas hit that hot surface igniter, it lit, and now there's flames going. And now the flame sense rod is telling the computer, I do see flame, so everything's good. Now it's running a timer, and when that timer expires, it's gonna fire up the blower motor. So if you guys look, you can see, gas is flowing, flame is running. You can actually see the flame going right through the flame sense rod right there. And now the blower motor has kicked on. And now it's actually making heat. Matter of fact, Kevin's not used to there being heat yet, so when it fires up, it kind of scares him. Man up, Kev. So now it's running, doing its thing. Uh, I'm gonna put the panel back on there. You can see my flue pipe comes up here runs across the ceiling, runs over here, it goes down a little bit and then it just goes out the wall. I ran down a little bit just because if I ran right out the top there, I'd kind of be running into the, the sill on the outside of the house and it would be a lot more difficult to, to poke through the wall there. So I came down a little bit. Uh, don't let it scare you that that flue comes down a little bit. With these furnaces that have the powered flue, 
you can actually run the flue down a little bit. It's not like in the olden days when it was all natural draft, the flue had to always be going up. That's not the case with these powered flues. There's a limit to how far down you can go, but if you look in your owner's manual, they'll tell you, you can come out of the top of the furnace and go down through the floor. You can do all sorts of stuff. You just have to check with the manufacturer's instructions to see what you can do. But regardless, having a little bit of a drop like that in a powered flue is, is not a problem. They do want you to pitch this so that you're condensing water in there all as much as possible, drains all the way back into the furnace, into your bucket or your drain. But I just ran this top part flat. I'm not gonna be running this furnace on a regular basis, so if some of the water works its way that way and freezes, that's not gonna be a problem because like I said, this furnace will, will not be running all the time. And I didn't, want, I didn't want to pitch that. I just wanted it to be nice and high and tight so that I could keep it out of my way. All right, so the furnace has been running for a couple minutes now. Um, it's already at 40 degrees. It makes, a, it makes a quick difference down here because, you know, I'm focusing most of the heat down here, which is a small area for an 80,000 BTU furnace. So I've got this one here blowing out some heat. You guys can't feel it, but it's nice and toasty right here. And anyways, then we come over here and these two just haul ass out of the floor here. And these are what really, you know, warms up under the loft here. I don't have what I would call long flowing hair, but if you guys, just to get an idea of how much these are blowing out, if I stand underneath these two, you can see that it, it blows my luscious hair around. So, you know, you wouldn't want that on a residential furnace setup, but for the way I have this in the garage, I do want these to, to can in out of here and just blow down and hit the floor and just kind of work its way across the garage. So the biggest part of this install, and, and by the way, I told you this furnace cost $200, but I, I paid about $600 in parts to install it with the gas piping, the flue vent piping and the ductwork, I'm in it about 600 bucks. So it's not like this whole installation was 200 bucks. It was 800 bucks. All those little pieces adds up real quick. But the biggest, the most labor intensive part was the gas pipe. I didn't have any gas line out here. I had to run this from the basement. So let me show you what I did here. Let me go down into the basement and show you where it starts. All right, so now I'm down in my basement here. And as you can see, my house has a Goodman furnace as well. When I, was, uh, when I was searching for furnaces, I was trying to get a Goodman because this furnace and the one in my garage now, they share a lot of the same parts. Some of the parts are different. This one has a different blower motor and this one has a different inducer motor, but the hot surface igniter and the flame sense rod and the air pressure switches and a bunch of other parts are exactly the same. So I've got a little bit of compatibility between the two. This one, the one out in the garage is an 80,000 BTU. This one is a 96,000 BTU. So this one's a little bit bigger, but they're very, very similar. Which by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm a little bit of an, a vintage RC car collector as well. I should, I don't have that many cars, but I should at some point in time do a little video where I show you guys what I have there. But anyways, so here is uh, right here, is where the the main gas line right there is the main gas line comes down into my basement and it came down here and I've got my furnace over here my hot water heater over here this all starts up this is a ranch so it's only a single story house the gas line starts up in the attic there's one tap for the fireplace which is over here and then there's a tap for a, a port on the back porch for a grill, but I don't have anything hooked up to that. That's it for the gas line. All of my other appliances are electric. There's nothing that I can do up in the attic because this house has like 20 inches of spray in insulation. And so I, I can't see the gas line. I don't know where there's any, any unions like this or anything to work with. So that wasn't really an option, but down here, this is the part I just added down here. This was a, uh, 
this is a one inch line and they just had a, a coupler or a union, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. I think it's a coupler. There was a line right here that just continued. And so what I did is I, I threaded things apart. Well, I obviously turned all the appliances off. I went out to the side of the house and I turned off the gas coming into the house. And then I came down here and I, I screwed this stuff apart up to this point. And then I took that coupler out and I put in this T and then I put all this stuff back together. And then I added this leg, which just, just comes off here. It goes up. I've got a, a coupler right here and it goes up to the ceiling. It's still a one inch. And then it runs across, drops down to three quarter inch. And then up there, it just turns and then I don't think you can see that, but it, it turns and then it goes through the wall and that's where it goes into the garage. And then when I was working on this line, I, I added this brace here to make the line much more stable. And I also added this plate up here. It's got, you can see it's got U-bolts clamping it to the gas line. And then it's got six screws. You can't see it, but it's got six screws in that plate where it bolts onto that beam there. What they had before was, um, they just had strap material like this. And it just, it ran down and it spiraled its way around the pipe and then they just had it looped around there. And number one, it was in my way, just as far as taking all the stuff apart. And number two, it it was real loose. Before this this gas line could wobble all over the place. Now it's it's real stable. I wanted it stable while I had my pipe wrenches on it and I was doing all that, but I just like it now because it's nice and, and stable anyways. It's always nice when you're working on your own residential stuff because you're never gonna do as nice of a job as you do when you're working on your own stuff. Um, this block is here because gas piping is not the most accurate stuff in the world. And these two lines are parallel. But by the time I had this T in there and all of these fittings, this piece was actually cocked in a little bit. And I need it, in order for this coupler to work, these two pieces need to be right in line with each other. So I put a spreader on here. I had to move this out about uh, five eighths of an inch so that it was straight. And then I just keep that board in there so that, so that there's not a lot of stress on that coupler. So then right here is where the gas line comes through the wall, where I just showed you down there. Comes over, I got a little drip leg there. Runs up, now it's three quarter inch. Got myself a little gas valve. Now it drops down the half inch. And then I've just got a flex line and that's where it feeds into the furnace. All right, that's it for this video, guys. I might not get anything done in the garage if I'm just up here <laughs> putting my hands on this. Like, I should store my tools up here. They would always be nice and toasty warm. Anyways, that's it for this video, guys. I just wanted to show you what I've been working on the last two weeks, which was uh, getting heat set up in this garage. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to ramp up 100% and I'm going to start working on that fiberglass one piece front end for ratchet so that I can get that knocked out and check that off the to-do list. So thanks for watching the video. Hope it's helping you guys with whatever you're working on and I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.